You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Hey everybody, this is Scott O'Donohoe, one of the pastors of the Village Church that gathers in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, This is our second episode in a series of podcasts attempting to recap some of the content from a series of classes we're holding in May of 2021 called Not Our Own. Uh, These classes uh, are here to help cultivate uh, clarity and compassion and an evangelistic community through conversations about gender and sexuality. If you've not yet listened to the first episode of the podcast series, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, we look at 1 Corinthians 5 through 6 and just kind of tee up uh, the, the way that we want to approach even these conversations uh, in, in our headspace and heart space um, and some, some really fundamental good news that we get to bring into this conversation. So I would encourage you to listen to that first episode. Uh, it's a recap of the whole first class. However, I think that format's going to be a little bit different moving forward. Um, I think I want to break up each class into some smaller bite-sized chunks uh, just to make it a little more subtopical if you're looking for a particular thing uh, or if you just want to refine a a thing that we heard about in the class, might make it a little bit easier than scrolling through the whole thing. And if you're listening at home, honestly, it'll make it easier probably to get through, um, to, to walk through it that way. So, uh, today, um, we're going to kind of break down uh, the first part of our second class, which uh, really was asking the big picture question of how did we get here? Um, how did we get here culturally, uh, where this is a thing that we have to talk about gender and sexuality, um, stuff that might feel familiar or foreign to us, depending on kind of where we're at, and, and how did it become so divisive, not just between the church and the culture, but even within the church itself, there's lots of disagreement uh, around this stuff. And so how did we get here? Um, and, and kind of the thing is the, the assumption that we bring into even asking that question in the first place uh, is that we're, we think we're talking about something new. <laughs> we, we think that we've arrived at, at some new destination or some uh, new point in history where this is a thing. But honestly, it's not new at all. Uh, I know for if you're listening to this, probably you're thinking of like the sexual revolution of the 60s as being this like huge pivotal point where um, sexuality and, and gender and all sorts of things like kind of find its finds its roots there in some way, shape, or form. But honestly, if you look at the grand scheme of history, um, that the sexual revolution of the 60s is not as revolutionary as we might think that it is. We, we've had clashing cultures, clashing ethics uh, within the church and between the church and the world for a long time. That stuff's not new. It's ancient. It's as old or even older than the Bible itself. Uh, and, and, and we'll see that as we dig into some of the biblical texts. Uh, honestly, like the reason that we're able to dig into the scriptures and say, hey, what does it say about some of these things? It's because they talk about those things that are happening uh, even in their day, right? Uh, in the Bible, they're not thinking about uh, tr- trying to figure out imaginary things that, that we can fight about in 2021. That's, that's not really a real thing for them yet, uh, but, but will be one day. They're like, yeah, what, what could they fight about in the future? And so they come up with stuff like incest and adultery and bestiality. and those. They're, they're, they weren't thinking that. They're talking about those things because those were things for them as well. Uh, And so while our conversations might sound different today, we're really not having any kind of brand new conversation uh, today. And so what I want to do is help kind of paint a picture of that a little bit for you. Um, Talking about the the culture of the time that the scriptures were written, Old Testament uh, and New Testament. Um, So if you, uh, in in relation to sexuality, if if you go to first century Rome, um, it was not scandalous at all for a married man to have multiple partners, multiple sexual partners. Um, They might have a a concubine. uh, They might have uh, another woman that they just kind of have a casual affair with, fills a particular need, and uh, that guy also has a wife that he comes home to. Um, That was not scandalous uh, in in the time that the the New Testament was being written. Uh, In fact, um, there was imagery of all kinds, erotic imagery, stuff that we would consider pornographic, um, depicted on all sorts of things. The most famous example that uh, I've read about in a couple different places was uh, it's this um, 
uh, like a water pitcher that was discovered in Rome that would have been just a, a water pitcher that you would have just on your dining room table. And it just depicted explicit sexual acts and behavior on the water pitcher. And so if you can imagine, you know, calling the family to dinner and then pouring, uh, you know, water into kids' sippy cups with that stuff on, on the water pitcher, and that's the kind of stuff uh, that they saw, the imagery that existed back in the day. We think of advertisements today uh, or stuff we see on TV or uh, what have you and scroll, scroll on our feeds or Instagram where I was like, gosh, like uh, the stuff that's out there today, but like, man, that stuff was, was in people's homes uh, at, at that point in time as well. Um, even same-sex uh, sexual relations, um, that was an accepted thing uh, according to social hierarchies in uh, the time of the New Testament. And so uh, if you were a, a higher social status person and a lower social status person, that kind of a relationship was normal. Um, in fact, uh, there was a, a specific kind of relationship like that, uh, pederasty, uh, which was, kind of, that word sort of describes a uh, discipleship relationship is uh, the wrong word for it uh, because we often attribute discipleship with following Jesus. Um, that's not what was going on here. But in terms of like training and mentoring, teaching, uh, all sorts of stuff between older men uh, and, and teenage boys, um, that was a specific relationship. And part of that relationship wasn't just education, mentoring, that stuff, but it was also, uh, there was also a sexual component to that as well. And that was perfectly acceptable. Uh, in fact, revered and esteemed in some ways in the Roman culture. Uh, when we look at, at the leadership of Rome um, in the first century, Nero, who you may have heard of, he was a Roman emperor. Uh, he married two men on, on two different occasions. So we see uh, same-sex marriage occurring in the time of the New Testament. There were even uh, consensual same-sex sexual relationships, uh, not involving any kind of power difference or social uh, dynamic or anything like that at all. Um, and so what we see is by the, the 400s uh, BC, um, we, we see these kinds of relationships uh, form. Um, we have uh, Parmenides, uh, who was a Greek philosopher, uh, and a, a Greek poet named Agathon. Um, both of these guys were in their own relationships with other, uh, other men who were their peers. Uh, even women, uh, which was pretty uncommon to see. Um, we look at uh, the first or second century, uh, uh, Clement of Alexandria. He was a church father in the, in the early church, and he talked about women who uh, were actually getting married out in the world, not in the church, but, but that women were getting married um, in, in the culture around them. There are, in fact, two named couples, uh, Berenike, in Mesopotamia was one couple. Uh, we know for sure that they were married. Um, and Megilla and Demonassa, uh, they were a couple. Not sure if they were married or not, but they were certainly together. Um, pretty uncommon to hear about female-to-female uh, -female relationships, and yet um, here they are in the time of the, the New Testament. Uh, even in, in pop culture, um, we see Roman novels like Satyricon and Ephesian tale. Um, they told these tales of uh, same-age men and in same-sex relationships together. And even mythology, uh, you guys may have heard of Achilles. Um, it's a story where we get our Achilles heel. Uh, we get the name for that from. Uh, he was a Greek hero before the time of the New Testament, and he was thought to have been in a same-sex uh, relationship as well. Uh, and even when we, we step back and we think about what did they believe um, in that time about sexuality, um, they for sure did not have the, the categories that we do today. They didn't think about stuff in terms of orientation, gay, straight, that kind of stuff. Um, but they did have ideas and beliefs that started to, to come to fruition um, at that time. There was a, a Greek physician in Ephesus, a guy named Seranus, who lived around the same time as Paul. And he believed that same-sex attraction was shaped more by nature than it actually was nurture, which is Actually, something that Aristotle, who you guys have probably heard of him before, um, a huge thinker, uh, he lived back in the, the 300s uh, BC. He believed the same thing, that there was a nature component to who we were attracted to. Um, there was another guy, uh, Dorotheus of Sidon. He lived in Alexandria in Egypt in the first century. Um, he actually wrote five books on astrology. Um, and in part of that book, part of that series of books, is laying out uh, how when people are born, um, like what, what's in the skies, what, where's the sun, where's the moon, what stars are out, that kind of stuff actually determines um, if you're going to be attracted to people of the same sex or different sex. And he believed that that was fixed based on the stars and the sun uh, and the moon. 
So this is the culture and the world of the scriptures, the world of the early church. Um, and so we think about what was the goal of the early church. Uh, man, they, they were planting the church. They were planting other local churches in other cities. There was this whole uh, movement about uh, the, the Gentiles being included in God's people, this big, huge breakthrough. And, and so they were inviting people out in the world to come into the church. They weren't just about merely preserving a sexual ethic from the world, but inviting the world into uh, some kind of sexual ethic. Uh, and so this is where we actually see, there's a historian, uh, Kyle Harper, and he wrote a piece that was titled, The First Sexual Revolution, How Christianity Transformed the Ancient World. Uh, and so it was actually the church, the early church that brought about the first sexual revolution to the ancient world, because we see ideas that are popular today, like consent, uh, men being called to fidelity, uh, the mutual belonging of our bodies uh, sexually to one another in marriage, husband and wife, that kind of stuff, uh, that originated from the church and transformed the culture uh, because of that. And so, man, this is, this is the world of the early church. This was uh, the role of the early church and what they were striving to do. So these are ancient conversations and not new ones. Um, what about gender? Uh, because this is a, a big question. There's less about gender, to be honest, um, because there's less category, categorical overlap, I would say, from the ancient world to our world today, but there's still some stuff. So uh, if you've heard of other uh, religions back in the day, you, you may have heard of Ishtar before, a goddess um, in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, she was kind of known for transgressing uh, what I would say conventional gender boundaries. And, and Ishtar, there were servants at her uh, temple, and, and they were men who, who, they were physiologically male, but they presented themselves as female when they served at the temple. In Galatia, uh, which might be a, a, a territory region that you're familiar with if you um, have heard of the book of Galatians before, uh, they had a number of goddesses in Galatia, and some of the servants there were also men, they were males, um, who were castrated and, and they took on a female role, not just at the temple, but in society at large. Uh, there was a, a leader um, in the Roman Empire. Uh, he was a, a, an emperor called Elagabalus. Uh, it's a great name. Uh, in the, the 200s um, AD. Uh, and he either wanted to be a woman or he believed himself to be a woman. That, that much isn't clear. Um, but, but he would pick up men in bars. He worked at brothels as a woman. Um, and in fact, gave himself away uh, as a bride because he, he believed or wanted to be uh, a woman. And even in, in pop culture, uh, there's a uh, Ovid, who was a Roman poet, actually lived right before Jesus was born uh, in the time of Caesar Augustus. And he wrote about a, a biological girl named Iphis who was raised as a boy, um, so kind of had this nurtured uh, gender expression or gender identity from his mom. Uh, this person, they, they fell in love with a girl, so uh, ended up being attracted to the same biological sex uh, and then wanted to marry her. So she prayed actually to the gods in this story that was written. Uh, she prayed to the gods to, that they would change her into a biological male so that that could happen, that you get married. Um, and the gods did that. And so we literally see, uh, even though it's fiction, it's a, it's a supernatural transition uh, that we see in, uh, in this story all about uh, gender. And so, man, again, these are... Uh, th these are not new conversations. This is the culture uh, and the world of the scriptures. The world of the early church, while it was growing, while it was being planted, while they were calling people in. Um, and so I share um, all this stuff for a few reasons. It's significant to us for a few reasons. Number one, again, our, our mission uh, is the same today as, as the early churches was back then. To take good news into the world and to make new disciples. Um, our job is not to merely preserve some moral sexual ethic, but to invite others into it by inviting them into the life of Christ and into the life of the church. Um, and that was messy. Uh, it created a whole host of problems and clashes and all sorts of things, but that is discipleship, right? If, if we perceive, and I think I said this in the last episode, if we perceive an increase 
and sexual or gender diversity um, in the culture today, then if we're doing our jobs as evangelists, we should see that kind of diversity increase here. We should see that clash and that messiness of discipleship occur within the local church. Um, Secondly, I kind of bring this stuff up because what we see in culture today is not some unprecedented issue. It's not some crazy new threat to the church. Um, Certainly for this age and our cultural expression of the church, we absolutely have specific things that we get to focus on and that we get to repent of and bring to light and ask the Lord to change in us. Uh, Abuse and covering up abuse in the church, um, even some unhealthy artifacts of like purity culture, uh, singleness and the way we've kind of devalued that in the church for a while. There there are some things that we get to certainly focus on uh, here at this point in time. Um, But man, in 2,000 years, if Jesus has not come back yet, uh, the church will still be thriving and it will still be talking about issues of gender and sexuality. <laughs> like that's that's just going to happen. If Jesus hasn't returned yet, those are going to be conversations in another 2,000 years, right? So this is not a, a, an existential threat to the church that it's never faced before. These are old uh, in the gates of hell, nor conversations about gender and sexuality will, will prevail against the church. And then lastly, um, I share all this cultural stuff because, man, the Bible is more competent to speak into this stuff than you actually might think. Um, Our worlds are not that distant. Uh, You think of sin, violence, oppression, moral upheaval, abuses of power, uh, all that kind of stuff. How far uh, have we really progressed if we survey the last 100 years? Uh, We might think of a lot of that stuff as like ancient, old-timey stuff that we've, we've We have certainly gone past that stuff, but not really. Like if we're honest about our history uh, and even kind of where we are today, we're still there. Uh, We sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that we're morally superior to the world of the Bible um, and therefore it it doesn't have the legs to correct us. But that's that's honestly just a place of, of pride and spiritual blindness. Uh, if, if we think that way. Um, that goes for, for culturally sensitive things, uh, like we're, we're going to talk specifically about homosexuality, transgender stuff, all of that, but it also goes for, for culturally numb and normal things as well, like lust and porn uh, and just masculinity and femininity that's kind of like, we, we try to Christianize it, but it's really cultural, that stuff as well. Um, and so look, the, the authors of the scriptures, they were not naive, they were n- ignorant, um, and, and their voices are not irrelevant to these conversations, um, especially when we remember that, hey, one of the co-authors of the Bible is the Holy Spirit itself, <laughs> right? So uh, we get to be reminded of that. Uh, so in, in that sense, we get to let the text lead us. We get to let the scriptures be our final rule of faith. Um, our experiences matter, science matters, uh, data matters, um, feelings matter, all that stuff. Like, I think this is one of the overcorrectives of the church is we we tend to like dismiss some of those things. Um, But in reality, we don't have to be afraid of the truth. We don't have to be afraid of people's stories or their feelings, where they're coming from. Um, We we get to have the scriptures as our final rule of faith. And if it is what we say it is, then we don't have to be afraid of letting other voices speak to us. We don't have to be afraid of letting those things collide and clash a bit. Um, we get to let the scriptures be our rule of faith in these conversations. So, so when we ask the question, like, man, how did we get here? Um, well, we kind of realize we've not maybe gone as far as we think we have. And in some sense, maybe we've been in a, uh, a bit of a historical, cultural cul-de-sac for a really long time, just kind of spinning round and round and round. So uh, the, the, maybe the better question, the bigger question is how did, how did we get here uh, just humanity-wise, right? Not just us specifically here in this moment, but how did humanity arrive at this place where these are things that we keep talking about thousands of years later and will uh, continue to talk about until Jesus comes back. So this is going to spur us to go to, to Genesis uh, 1 and 2 and 3. But before we hop in there, um, we'll do that in the next episode. I just want to tee us up real quick for a way for us to think about the scriptures. Because just as much as, as it's helpful for us to know kind of what was swimming around in the culture of the day and how not so distant uh, they may have been from us, we also have to realize there is a distance between us and the original authors of the scripture. Um, it's a really helpful phrase. I heard it for the first time from Dr. John Walton. And he said this, that the Bible was written for us, not to us. 
right? The Bible was written for us, but the Bible was not written to us, right? It was written by um, ancient authors to ancient peoples uh, in an ancient language with ancient categories of thought and all that stuff. And so while the Bible is more competent than we might think it is to to help us with these things, um, that doesn't mean that its authors were thinking the same way that we think about stuff, talking about things the same way that we talk about stuff, asking the same questions, having the same categories of thought. Um, Understanding of science certainly wasn't there. Uh, All of that stuff, like those things are not one-to-one from uh, from then to today or from today back to then. We're talking about ancient Judaism stuff here, right? So there's no cross-hormone therapy. There's no gender identity or fluidity categories in their minds. Um, there was honestly no disagreement, no major disagreement on sexuality and gender stuff in Judaism for, for hundreds of years, both before and after the New Testament, all right? And so if we want to honestly honor uh, the authority of the scriptures, to be true about uh, what its authors are trying to say, then, then we have to let the authority rest in the authors of the Bible. Now, we can't make it say more than it does. Um, and we also shouldn't say that it's saying less than it's actually saying. We shouldn't divorce the scriptures from their cultural context, right? So uh, our goal as we approach the scriptures, it's not just to take off whatever lenses that we might bring, whatever cultural lenses and assumptions we might bring. We have to put on uh, ancient Jewish lenses as we read the text. Um, I saw a meme, you know, float around uh, a few weeks ago that basically like was just depicting all these different kinds of lenses, be they rainbow flag or American flag or uh, what have you that are over our eyes as we try to read the scriptures um, that clouds the way that we think about stuff. And the goal of the, I think the point of the meme was saying, hey, we gotta, we gotta take off all these false ways, all these assumptions we bring to the text so we can finally read it clearly. Um, but I just, I want us to know that that there is no, at, at no point can you arrive at some purely objective standpoint for you to be able to look at the scriptures. Um, our job, you can, you can take off all the lenses that you want to, and it's, it's helpful to be mindful of the assumptions you do bring to the text, and we should know what those are. But if you took all those away, you still wouldn't be an ancient Israelite. <laughs> you still wouldn't be thinking like the authors of the Bible if you had no idea about the way they thought about things. Um, so our job is to help to, to try to get into the heads of the authors and understand what they would have meant, what it would have meant to the hearers and, and the authors at that point in time so we can understand what it means for us today. With that, uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, Hopefully that was a little bit helpful for you. Um, Next time, we will hop into Genesis uh, and start taking a look at uh, how humanity in general uh, got to the place that it's in. So thanks for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.